Well then everyone, welcome to the World Armouries. My name is David, part of the Live Interpretation team. And over here we have Andrew. And today what we're going to be doing is highlighting the techniques and weapons utilised during the late 16th century and early 17th century. Now, to do this, we're going to use in part the play Romeo and Juliet, written during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I by our foremost playwright, Sir William Shakespeare. Now, a number of you may have seen this play performed in film and television or in theatre, but hopefully today you'll gain some new insights. Yes, because the shape of this play is simply chock full of information around sword fighting. Why? Well, it's partly because the sword was still the predominant uh, weapon of self defence at the time, but also Shakespeare himself did sort of like interest in swordsmanship. Not only do the lines of this play contain information around it, but even the stage direction. For example, Act 1, Scene 1. Well, this opens with the stage directions. Enter Samson and Gregory of the House of Cabinet bearing swords and bucklers. Now, this was a reference to the traditional English combination of a broad bladed sword and a small rounded shield or buckler, both which were common on the battlefields of the day and, of course, amongst the lower class of merchants and apprentices. Now, these weapons were used in a combination of both cuts and thrusts with the swords and deflective beats and punches with the buckler. Now, when Abraham and Balthazar of the House of Catholics enter, Samson urges his friends with the words, Remember thy swashing bros. <laughs> A 
of a silk bottle. Now, to further highlight this Italian style, we're going to be looking at the work of Vincenzo Saviolo and his best published book on sword fighting. Now, Saviolo, what was he teaching his students? Well, to begin with, an upright position, and he was teaching them a circular form of swordsmanship, but to put their faith in the thrust and to ignore the cut or slap, or to use the pointes more ready and spend it not the right time. So he was basically saying, pokey stuff quicker. <laughs> so on to our third demonstration. Now, because of the delicate nature of many of the targets involved, and by that I mean this long leg here, yeah, it's rather flimsy, so it's likely to bounce off bone. So in the following demonstration, I should be looking at very specific targets on my friend David here, predominantly being thrust into his armpit, piercing the skin, redirecting and driving down into the heart and lungs. Or, simply thrust through the throat and the windpipe into the spine, or smash through the mouth or the eye socket into the brain. <laughs> um, Andrew, may I suggest we take this one a little um, slower? Huh. Yes? Yeah. It's stylized fashion. We'll call it stylized. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Snap the tip off, thus to say, to cut someone down to size. Ah. Yeah. Now, those that were still fans of the old English style, of both cuts as well as thrust, well, they had their own champion. In an Englishman, thank the Lord, by the name of Mr. George Silver. Now, he published his practice in 1599, Paradoxes of Defence. And in it, he ridicules the Italians and their admirers, saying, Bring to me a fencer. I'll bring him out of his fence tricks with good downright blows. He further cautions his readers too. Beware of false teachers of defence. You see, Silver was above all a pragmatic man. He believed that his downright blows or cuts were as quick, if not quicker, than the Italian style's thrusts. Moreover, would deliver a far more disabling wound. And besides, he added, these days they teach no grinds, no closes, they teach no wrestling, no strikes with the hilt, oh, and no kicks or knees to the cops. Oh. Now, our plowman will do all these things with great strength and energy. But our school man, he being fast tied to such school plays as he has learned, is had more without the benefit of nature. But our plowman, with nature and without art, is a far better man than he. Well, it's your line, then. <laughs> Just carry on with that. <laughs> so, back to the play. Act 3, scene 2. Now, Mercutio has been killed by a thrust from the villain Tybalt. However, the wound itself goes almost unnoticed within the characters of the play. In fact, his friend Benvolio asks, What? Hello, Matt? Oh, I scratch. Sorry, right, just enough. Where's my page? Well, go, villain, fetch me a surgeon. Now, even Romeo, and for monetary reasons now, David will be playing Romeo. Now, even Romeo underestimates the severity of the wound, and he adds, Courage, man, the hurt cannot be much. Oh, it's not as deep as a well, or as wide as a church door, which is enough to we'll serve. Ask for me tomorrow, you shall find me a great man. <laughs> 
I am peppered our work for this world. A plague on both your houses. Now Shakespeare's audience would have known enough about swordplay to appreciate that Mercutio, being prevented from making his defense by Romeo's intervention, and taken up the rust down into those lungs. So he was basically saying his last few lines of text as his lungs simply filled with his own blood. So Mercutio, well, he probably drowned. Now, a survivor of such a conflict can owe their success or victory to more than just mere technique. And so to finish off our interpretation, we want to show you what they will take up the scene shortly after the death of Mercutio, where Romeo is out in the street seeking Tybalt with nothing but vengeance for his fallen friend on his mind. Now, we believe this is going to highlight what may have, or certainly did happen, according to Silver, when these two stars of fencing met, not in the fencing schools, but on the streets themselves. Now, I would be adopting as Romeo the English style of fencing, but cuts as well as thrusts. Whereas Tumult will favour the far more fashionable Italian style of thrusting only. Alive and triumph, a Mercutio slave. Away every respect and dignity in the fire! Now, Tim, I'll give back again the dinner that thou gavest me. For Mercutio's soul lay little way above our heads, waiting for thine to keep him company. Either thou, or I, or both shall go with him, thou wretched boy. The consorts with him here shall with him hence. This shall decide that! <laughs> 